Georgetown University campus, much like 27 other Jesuit colleges and universities in the U.S., abounds with student energy and optimism. Less immediately apparent to the casual observer is something all Jesuit universities have in common, a dedication to a brand of Christian commitment to community and service that can be largely traced to one Jesuit priest named Pedro Arupe. September 13, 1983. Father Pedro Arupe makes his last formal appearance as head of the largest and one of the most prominent religious organizations in the Catholic Church. The warm reception he enjoys at his farewell fails to reveal the agonizing turmoil that has led to this day and to the election of his successor. Only those present might note the significance of small details. Kissing the hand of Father Detza, who Pope John Paul II had appointed to replace him 25 months before. The wiping of a tear by Father Vincent O'Keefe, his second in command for 18 years. My most respected and dear Father Arupe. The story of Pedro Arupe turns out to be of a man whose life is shaped by course-changing events in the history of the world, of the Church, and the Society of Jesus. He was born in the same fiercely independent Basque country of northern Spain that had produced Ignatius Loyola and Francis Xavier more than four centuries earlier. Pedro is the youngest of five children. His mother dies when he is 10, his father eight years later. At the early age of 15, he leaves home to enter medical school at the University of Madrid. In his first year, he wins the top prize in anatomy, the first of many awards. He is on his way to finishing medical school in the top tier of his class when he accepts an invitation to visit the Marian Shrine of Lourdes as a member of a commission responsible for attesting or not attesting to the validity of miraculous claims. For me, Lourdes is a city of miracles. I stayed there for some three months. I was thus the witness of three miraculous cures from the very moment they took place in the midst of the faithful who were praying to the Virgin Mary, and then on through the medical verification that was carried out by doctors who were atheists. This impressed me very much, because I had often heard my professors in Madrid, who also were atheists, speak of the superstitions of Lourdes. There was born my vocation. It is 1927 when Arupe embraces the secluded life of a Jesuit in training. His studies return him to his Basque homeland in the shadow of the basilica dedicated to Ignatius Loyola. By 1932, Spain is on the brink of civil war. The new Republican government sees the Catholic Church as a cause of many of the very social ills it seeks to cure. The Spanish Republic's new constitution expels all Jesuits from the country. Arupe joins his fellow seminarians in exile, first in Belgium, then in the Netherlands. After being ordained a priest, he continues his theological and spiritual training in the United States. It is now 1938, at the brink of World War II, when he is unexpectedly assigned to become a missionary in Japan. Already multilingual, Arupe dives into his study of Japanese and a lifelong mission of intercultural understanding. 
I must say that at the time, I did not focus on the transcendent aspect of the missionary experience, but rather on certain negative personal aspects, the discovery of a reality different from what I expected, and above all, the feeling of loneliness. And I experienced an even greater loneliness when I went to Ubi, 21 hours by train from Tokyo, for my first mission assignment, although I spoke Japanese only very poorly. Another important personal event was my imprisonment for one month in Yamaguchi. Japan was at war and I was suspected of espionage. I spent days and nights in the December cold, entirely alone. Many were the things I learned during this time. The science of silence, of solitude, of severe and austere poverty, of inner dialogue with the guest of my soul. When later he was made the director of novices, uh, these were all Japanese with some Koreans, uh, for this Westerner to deal with, with somebody from a completely different culture was very difficult, but he had made it a point to try to get inside the culture so he could really talk to these people, and he was good at it. In fact, he ended up writing about six books in Japanese on the spiritual exercises. August 6th, 1945, begins as an unremarkable morning for Arupe and his young Jesuit students on the outskirts of Hiroshima. The hum of an approaching airplane does not seem particularly threatening. They're used to hearing armadas of bombers overhead. Today, there is no siren to raise the level of fear. the 6th, 1945, when the first atom bomb fell on Hiroshima, Arupe and his group were just outside the city limits. They heard it, and they, they, everything blew apart in the house. They didn't know what it was. The fate of Father Arupe and his novices is later filmed for the record by the American government. A group of Jesuits who were teaching in Hiroshima witnessed and survived the explosion. Between Zero Point and the main building of the novitiate of Jesuits was a hill which served to lessen the intensity of the blast. Yet, despite this protection, the glass in the doors of the main entrance foyer were shattered and the paneled ceiling was blown loose by the force of the explosion occurring four miles away. Father, would you introduce yourself, please? In future years, Arupe would be called upon many times to tell his story beginning immediately with U.S. newspaper reporters and military investigators. What were you doing in Hiroshima at the time of the explosion? Suddenly, we saw a blinding light, like a flash of magnesium. We heard a formidable explosion. After about 15 minutes, we noticed that in the direction of the city, dense smoke arose. We climbed a hill to get a better view. Before us was a decimated Hiroshima. Father Arupe, uh, he's been famous for that, for having been having been one of the witnesses of the falling of the first atomic bomb. I shall never forget my first sight of what was the result of the atomic bomb. A group of young women, 18 to 20 years old, clinging to one another as they dragged themselves along the road. On and on they came, a steady procession numbering some 150,000. 